Uh, so welcome to another um, series of Idea Collider with uh, leaders in innovation. I'm delighted to be joined by Jackie Hunter of Benevolent AI. Uh, first of all, would you like to tell us more about you and about Benevolent? Yeah, I'm a board director of Benevolent AI. I've been with the company um, since 2016, where I came to set up the drug discovery and development uh, arm of the business. It was founded in 2013, and the vision of the founders, um, Ken Mulvaney, was really to harness the power of all the information that is out there to make better decisions, come up with improved targets, and reduce the cost and time of drug discovery and development. Both he and I have seen from big and small pharma, you know, there are big issues. Big pharma is slow to make decisions because of just big organisations usually are, but has a lot of money. And the smaller companies could be nimble and quick, but didn't have the resources and the cash of the larger companies. Yeah. And we thought there was a real opportunity to be able to improve the way we did drug discovery. I mean, it costs 2.5 billion to bring a new drug to the market, there's no way that all the products that come to the market will recoup that. And the reason it costs 2.5 billion is because you're paying for all the failure. And I think it's probably the only industry I know that has a sort of 97% failure rate. Yeah, interesting. I literally wrote a paper about that last week on, on the cost of failure and the uh, and what you can do about it. So. Oh, right. I'm going to dive into that yeah, a lot yeah, more with you, that's okay. So, is it even unpacking what you just said there? So, there's an interesting thing that you said about better decisions. Yes. Um, decision making is uh, is typically poorly understood as a as a science or as a discipline within this industry. Can you tell me more about your well, thoughts? My thoughts are. Uh, I mean, I remember Ken Caton from Tufts came to talk to us at GSK um, and said. The one thing the pharmaceutical industry could do is make better decisions. Now that sort of sounds trite and a bit obvious, but I think the issue is that there's so much information around that unless you use this new technology, you can't harness that information. And so you're making your decisions on a very small portion of the evidence. Mm. And so I've sat in senior meetings in pharmaceutical companies person who is pushing that particular idea, that particular product, comes along, they have to be passionate about it because you need to have a champion, but you also need to have the evidence before you to make a judgment to say actually is what they are telling me the sum of the whole picture and you can use this technology to go and for example dive into past clinical trials, pull out more information about why a drug failed or mm. whether there were particular subset of patients that responded in ways that you know hitherto we just haven't been able to do. So I think that for me it's making better decisions because you've got more evidence. You have mm. to believe that if you've got a better evidence base the decisions you make mm. are going to be more likely to be correct. Mm. And is there a sense of maybe anonymizing or dehumanizing that process as well because people tend to come with their biases and priors. Oh, I've got a really good example. Absolutely. Um, we came up with a set of hypotheses in glioblastoma, a very horrible, nasty disease. Unfortunately, I have lost two friends to it. And one of those particular targets was a class of drugs that I had worked on for pain and other indications in the past, and they haven't worked. Now, my bias, even though I know zip about glioblastoma and oncology in general, would have been to damn prioritize that target just because I'd had a bad experience with it in the past. Mm. And yet the machine had surfaced it as being you know, potentially very interesting. And lo and behold, the person who was working on that project took the set of hypotheses to a collaborator who independently had screened a whole load of drugs in his assay and guess what? 
one of the ones that worked, targeted that class that I just had downplayed in my mind yeah. and brought my own bias to it. So I do think this um, lack of bias, certainly when surfacing and, and, and evaluating the bulk of the information, mm. is very powerful. Mm. Of course, bias comes from insight and experience, and so then you can bring the insight and the experience on that much more unbiased set of mm. hypotheses. Mm. And you mentioned that you think large organisations are slow, mm. and maybe old-fashioned in, in some of the ways they're thinking, and some companies and smaller companies are too small to have that. Would you see what your you know, your vision is part of, is, is closing that gap between you know, large and capable, but, in, but, but poor at making decisions and small, potentially agile? And yes, definitely. I mean, I think one of our advantages is that we're the only really company doing what we are doing, going all the way from really early hypothesis generation through to sort of phase two clinical trials. So we've got that capability and it's important because the people we have on the clinical side can think about in, uh, inputting into the types of target we work on, the diseases we work on and the data we get can feed back in uh, and, and we can bring the translational medicine further into the pipeline but also some of the earlier thinking can feed forward into selecting and stratifying patients. So, you need to have a kind of circular rather than a linear mm. process. Mm. It, it feels like a process that, you, that people need to move towards though instead of away from because yeah. it's, it's hard to argue with what you just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I wanted to get back to the sort of definitions of innovation because clearly mm. you would be identified as in the inventive kind of world and, and your own background in innovation gives you a lot of, of, yeah. of, uh, of, of insight. How do you define innovation? You think for me, innovation is it's not just having an idea about doing something differently or making something new. It's about taking that idea and then actually delivering on it, actually um, applying it. Um, it could be a social innovation. It could be something like you know, the impact of microfinance that that have a huge impact societally. Um, or it could be a product or service, or it could be a business model innovation. One of the, the, the challenges I think we found is initially when we had discussions with larger companies is they were very used to just operating a service provider model, mm. um, especially with tech companies. Mm. And actually what we bought is uh, because of the, the investment that we've put into developing our technology, we wanted to have a collaborative model where we could bring our disease, if you like, Mm. knowledge graph and our, our, our predictive mm. chemistry and the company could bring their expertise in that disease area and, and data mm. and you know that's a really good collaboration but it took some companies a bit of time to get their heads around it. Yeah. Why, why is that do you think? Is that the same problem that they have in decision making? Well I, I think it's just it's doing things a bit differently yeah. and I think if you think about the pharma business models they tend to be quite Stereotypes, you know, it's quite, and it's actually really interesting. There's been a lot of talk over the last decade about open innovation mm. in the pharmaceutical industry, but I would say it's only in the last five years that companies have really begun to adopt some of those open innovation principles. There's been a lot of in licensing into a company, but very little spinning stuff mm. out, mm. And, and that's starting to change. And so innovation is not only about having control over your idea to make it happen, it's about saying this is the best way that we could make our idea create value for us or society or patients. And it may be that it actually goes um, through a partnership with somebody else. I mean, we have a huge knowledge graph with billions of facts and we can use it to generate hypotheses for any disease, but we can only work on a few diseases ourselves. Right. So to optimise the value for the company, you know, we don't just sit on diseases that we're mm. not going to work on, we try and actively partner. So we mm. saw recently, recently yeah. this week, we announced with Neuropol mm. uh, that we're going to collaborate on autophagy. Okay. 
Okay. Um, we're obviously working with AstraZeneca on chronic kidney disease and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Yeah. So, you know, that's a way in which we can put our technology out there, if you will, and work collaboratively mm. to be able to, to get value for patients, get value for big collaborating companies and ourselves. Yeah. And so there's a kind of bell curve of you know, some companies are thinking about doing things differently rather yeah. than just doing the same thing yeah. harder and bigger. Okay. And, and so and your distinction was between invention, you know, the kind of ideas yeah. and the kind of delivery of value yes. back to the organization. Yeah, in a way, I mean, you know, anybody can have an idea, but if we don't move it, mm -hmm. uh, that's not innovation. Mm -hmm. And and actually I, I've seen some small startups where the the founders are so worried about losing control that yeah. they don't take in the investment that they need, and so the whole thing just drags on and on and on. Yeah. Far too. Yeah. Whereas if they just thought, actually, we're going to do this to do it quickly. We need this amount of money. We're going to have to give up some control. Yeah. The whole project would have moved ahead much more rapidly. So do you see yourself here as part as being in that learning process as well? Because you know, you're not fixed on your model either. So. Well, we're, yeah, we're learning all the time because yeah. what we're doing is so new. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons that it's great that Joanna Shields has come is because uh, you know her background in scaling up in, in tech mm -hmm. brings uh, to the benevolent group of companies uh, a real wealth of experience. So, mm -hmm. so it's it's a learning environment for us all. And the other thing that we've We've would really had to learn about is how to work together. Mm -hmm. So you know, internally, how, internally yeah, a yeah. data scientist views yeah. the world very differently from a biologist yes. or a chemist. Yeah. And you know, the biologists and chemists have to focus down on what questions they really want answering, mm. and the data scientists have to be able to deliver on, on that. Working with actually quite messy data mm. in many cases. Yeah, I mean, biology data is messy. Yes, inherently. And that was part of the belief like five years ago was that pharma was missing a whole tranche of data scientists yeah. and, and even the interesting learning about how to play with those folks. So you were kind of pushing that edge. Yeah, and, and I would say it took a couple of years before that really embedded. Yeah. And you know, now we have cross functional teams. We take the best of, of both worlds really. We we do have startups, um, stand ups and you know, sprints and cycles. But overlaid with that are some of the project management expertise that you see in pharmaceutical companies, mm. so that we can, you know, both look to the long term because drug com drug programs are long, yeah. uh, but also maximise the kind of ways of working that agile startups have. Yeah, and would it just to loop back to something you said earlier about the kind of cost mm. of R and D and launch. Is that part of your active vision to lower the cost of yes. doing this? And we've already shown we can because we can get to, and it's not just us actually, other companies have shown that you can uh, reduce the time from a chemical starting point to a candidate down to somewhere between 12 to 14 months. Traditionally, it's usually about three years, sometimes two. Mm -hmm. um, now, straight away, you know, you're probably making 10% of the molecules. Mm -hmm you're cutting the time by a third, two thirds. Um, and, and so what you're actually going to see is, even in the early phase, you can cut costs quite considerably. Mm. And then if you look at some of the work that's been in patient stratification, if you can pick the right patient, mm. then you should be able to do smaller and more effective clinical trials. Mm. And we've already modeled some of that on publicly available data in, in mm. ALS, for example. So, so I'm very confident that we'll increase the success, mm. but I know we can cut the cost of mm. failure. Mm. And, and the paper I mentioned last week was on the, the failures in phase three, which is where, yeah. you, where you'd expect not to be losing drugs for yeah. efficacy, for example, you'd expect not to be losing them for, you know, those kind of variable things like finance and strategic yeah, business decisions. Yeah, yeah. People are taking drugs into phase three and then stopping once they've Part of the problem there is that they get the money back when they do launch another drug yeah. and, and it becomes an expensive one. So this kind of upward spiral is part of the... Yeah, the I mean, if you look at I mean, uh, the statistics show that you're still seeing 50% of drugs in phase three failing and yeah. that's, that's just not good. Absolutely, yeah. With what you would have to regard as predictable sort of uh, parameters. Yeah, so one of the things I think by better understanding your patient population, this is I think why Roche brought flat iron, 
they had such a wealth of patient data, they could look to see how you could design a phase two trial to mimic, or even phase three, to mimic your real world prescribing mm. practice, mm. as opposed to, mm. you've got very narrow criteria in phase two, you expand it a bit in phase three, mm. and then it goes out into the wild west when you put it out into the hands of your general yeah. practitioners. And everyone gets surprised, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 and, and that, that is this kind of unspoken problem of our industry, right? which is we look for this pure signal and not, in the clinic yeah. and then send it into a very dirty world yeah. uh, where people are taking all kinds of things or not taking them or... or uh, exactly, I mean, it, it, you know, people are on combinations of drugs all the time. Yeah, yeah. And we give exactly the same dose to a 50 kilo little old lady as we do to a 120 mm. kilo bodybuilder, mm -hmm. you know, so mm. sumo wrestler. So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of variation in, in general practice or even in specialities that mm -hmm. it's just not accounted for at the moment. But hopefully, if we can look at the data in a much more high throughput automated way, mm -hmm. we'll be able to pick up the patterns and the signals mm -hmm. that might allow us to cut that phase three failure rate. I have to begin that feedback loop because yes. there's a lot of people who don't want all of that data once it goes into the real world yeah, to yeah. come back in. Right? So I guess that's a so, um, innovation itself, is that a kind of active process here? Do you actively manage innovation? Well, I think any company should be actively managing innovation, but it actually matters much more in a company like ours, where, you know, you, you need to get to the next value inflection point. So mm. we've got to make sure that we are innovating. Mm. And, and frankly, if you're not measuring it, then you know that is bad for your business because uh, yeah. Einstein said the surest way of of, uh, of going backwards is, is standing still. So yeah. we've got to be constantly innovating. Now, if you're looking at something like pharmaceutical industry, we can measure that in in the number of patents filed. Mm. But in the tech world, patenting is is less common because it's really your know-how, and there we can measure our innovation by the number of quality hypotheses we generate um, as a surrogate for progression mm. in disease and also validate, so importantly, the ones that we validate in our um, disease models, either internally or externally. Um, and one of the things that I think we've been very good at is, is also designing the system so that when we make changes, we can check whether or not we have actually improved the system. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't know, I think that's something that uh, it is, is routinely done, but certainly one of the things and one of the benefits, I think, about having clinical studies within our company is right from the get-go, we're thinking about version control, mm -hmm regulatory submissions, mm. so that we have to make sure that everything is really very well documented. Mm. So that decision quality is yeah. part of your metric. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Which is interesting because, you know, you look at the kind of archaic approach of TPPs and everything else and the kind of toll gates that pharma goes yeah. through. The, the, there's actually very little re-examination of whether any of that is useful. Yeah. yeah. So, and is that, like, what you're saying here is it's embedded it, absolutely, it's embedded in our company, and I think, I mean, I remember when I worked for Smith Klein Beecher, um, we were told we weren't going to look at Siroxac, the antidepressant, in postpartum depression, and I said, why? And nobody should come back and say, mm. why? Mm. That had been excluded. There was Some, no documentation. Somebody, said, yeah. somebody Again, somebody's, somebody's viewpoint, well, and another classic one, actually, was when Glaxo and Smith Klein merged. J.P. Garnier got migraine, um, and uh, he didn't believe that you could tell that you could have, he didn't get uh, mm -hmm. sort of symptoms alerting him to the fact he was going to get a migraine. Right. And so he didn't believe in migraine prophylaxis. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah. migraine prophylaxis is yeah. a huge market. Again, yeah. it's, it yeah. shows how one person's view can, yes. can actually shape the decisions of organisation. And there's a lot of that, right? Which is the people use their own one kind of views of disease to inform their yeah, exactly. their, their R and D strategies. Okay, so you know, constant measurement, uh, 
with internal references, external references as well? So well, we, I mean, we do do benchmarking, yeah. yeah. And um, so we have our internal benchmarks and external benchmarks as well, uh, say on publicly available data sets, etc. Mm. So mm. I think all of that is really, really important. Mm. And we can also go back to the source of the information as well. So when we generate hypotheses, we can look to see where that information surfaced and whether mm. the highest, I mean, we could go back through the sort of 400,000 pieces of information if we wanted to, but it's really where the, the key um, pieces of information are. So if, for example, it turned out that looking at that paper or that patent, it, it, it had flaws in it, we can signal that in the system okay. so that it gets downgraded yeah. as yeah. a source of information later. Yeah, so the weighting yeah. is the hardest part. Is that, um, yeah. So, so, so you've you can contrast large pharma f from your own experience with you know with the way things are today. So what have you learned over the, that sort of time period? Well, I mean, clearly uh, the importance of, of, of evidence-based decision making mm. is really important. And actually, funnily enough, um, you know, I, I, I think that the whole thing about drilling down to root cause analysis is really important. The trouble with us as scientists is when we see a problem, we jump into solution mode. Mm -hmm. And actually, quite often, the solution we're proposing doesn't tackle the root cause of the problem. Yeah. And if we think about diseases, you know, finding the, what is the critical node in a particular disease pathway is really essential. But the other thing that's really important is the people. Mm -hmm. um, you are only as good as the weakest link in your team. And you need to have diverse teams. And by, I don't just mean in terms of protective characteristics, yeah. I mean in terms of thinking. Quite often the, the person who is the most innovative is not necessarily the person who's going to be actually reducing it to practice and, mm. or managing the people who are going to run the project. Mm. And you've got to find a way to balance that and make room for those people. I used to say there's this one guy I used to have I call him the drug discovery leprechaun sitting on his shoulder because he'd always somehow just managed to pull out the best targets and yeah. come up with some really interesting ideas. But he wasn't necessarily the best manager of people, so he wouldn't be rising up in the organisation to be a leader at that at a more senior level. But you had to find a way of making that person feel valued and, mm. and wanted and giving them the space to do so. Mm. So do you think it's likely that you, as you grow, you'll end up looking like an, like an organisation that we currently recognise, or do you think because of those things that you'll look different? I would hope we look different. Yeah. I would hope that you know, we will change and evolve, and our business will change and evolve as we scale up and yeah. grow. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think you can be prescriptive about what that's going to look like. Technology is changing everything so fast, how we work. Mm. You know, even now we have cross-functional teams, you can be doing a chemistry design program with somebody in New York or yeah. Antwerp or you know, with Cambridge and London, mm -hmm. virtually with the machine, yes, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's just a different way of working. Because there's a significant contrast between say the way the tech careers grow, yeah. which with encouraging diversity, encouraging team-based collaboration, but not having progress in your career to the point where you get to make all the decisions yes. that, that you've only been preparing for before. Yeah, and, and actually I'd say for me it's been a bit of a, a learning as well, sort of seeing how cross-functional teams that self-organise mm. can work together so well. It's not a structure that I'm used to in the pharmaceutical industry, mm. uh, where it's much more kind of regimented and rigid, yes. but it's good to feel uncomfortable sometimes. Well, it's one of the things that kind of, uh, we get those curves crossing of experience and uh, unwillingness to be wrong or yeah, vulnerable yeah, yeah. as well, but uh, uh, that, 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 that doesn't occur very often. So what are the things that matter? You know, you've mentioned culture, diversity, the ecosystem, the decision making. Yeah. What are the other things that you're trying to model as you, as you grow? Um, well, obviously to grow you need to have funding and so, you know, we We've been very successful in raising raising money, but longer term, we want to be able to show more proof points of the technology, uh, and that 
Now that's really why I came to work at Benevolent because I knew we had to do drug discovery differently and it's important for me that actually we do discover medicines for patients. Mm -hmm. You know, we're working on diseases like motor neuron disease, and I mentioned glioblastoma, which are really underserved. I mean, you know, they are, unless you're someone like Stephen Hawking, a death sentence. Mm -hmm. People are doing a case of glioblastoma frequently a year. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I think this technology is the only way that we'll be able to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I'm really looking forward to the day when Benevolent can say we've got a drug in the clinic for ALS, we've got a drug in the clinic for glioblastoma. I think mm. that would be fabulous. And how far away is that? Well, we've got we've got a you know, drug program in in, in uh, both those areas. So yeah, I, I hope it's not that far. Away. Not too far away. And what drives you personally? What's the What's your motivation on a Monday morning? Well, my mo I mean, my motivation is is exactly that: is to is for this company to show we can do things differently and to produce effective medicines, um, and and hopefully through our collaborations with pharma partners, allow them to be more successful too, so we can reach a greater range of diseases, mm. and and. Actually, I think it's this kind of thing that's going to save the industry. Mm. Really. Mm. It's hard to see that it hasn't got a future in the industry. What, what are the barriers to this becoming more part of things quickly? Well, I think there are a, there are a couple of big barriers, and I think the first is the availability of the correct talent, because data scientists are. Kind of high demand, mm. and then having the environment that allows you to thrive and have the impact on the organisation. And, and one of the things I love about here is it, it kind of puts the information in the hands of the scientists, whereas you've got um, organisational setups in big companies where you have your chemoinformatics, your bioinformatics, and they're almost gatekeepers. To the data from the mm. to the scientist and and so finding a way in which those expertise and skills can be utilized and still work but at the same time uh, allow the more free flow and input of the scientists onto those processes that's you, you've got a lot of established um, uh, organizational structures that I think could uh, be an impediment to the adoption of this technology. Mm. And it's not just in companies, I think it's the same in universities as well, they're organised along very traditional lines, especially medical schools. Mm. And I think we may have to think about... Blurring those lines all the yeah, way yeah. yeah. So for some people are going to not do well in, the, in that in the new setup, some people are going to do very well in the yeah, new yeah. setup. I mean, we desperately need the people who can straddle both the data science and the domain expertise because they can facilitate the mm. interaction and collaboration. Mm. Okay, and I realise that we're using our time really quickly here, but there's a few things I want to, I always ask everyone, which is yeah. are, are books that you would recommend, that you've loved, that have made a big difference to you. There's the best book on innovation is Making Innovation Work by um, David Padilla, Epstein and Shelton, I think it is. Wharton Press, super book. Okay. I gave Andrew Whitty a copy of it when I left GSK. And then um, I think Startup Nation is a really interesting mm. study of how Israel mm. and it, its ecosystem, how it works, mm. and, and it has been so successful at innovation. Yeah. And what was, it, what was the key takeaway from that? In terms of oh, I think the key takeaway from that actually, there were two. two. One was that um, because everybody went into the military, they were superbly well networked when they came out of the military. Okay. With not necessarily people from their own yeah. specialism. Yeah. And secondly, that uh, Israel has a lot of venture money, and that allowed the flow of ideas to, to, to happen much more easily. Fantastic, very interesting. And you, in your next five years, yes. where, where, where is Benevolent? 
Well, where, where you... as I say, I hope we can have a, you know, a couple of drugs in the clinic for these serious diseases. And I'm hoping to move from making cider to learning how to make cows or something. That's at home. Okay. That's my ambition. <laughs> Wait a minute, I was waiting for the metaphor. <laughs> no, no, no. No, That's, uh, no, no. Okay. Fantastic. And, um, and certainly one is easy. <laughs> you're you're Calvados. Are you allowed to make Calvados at home? I think so. There's a, there's a limit. It's only for personal consumption. Okay. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and in terms of benevolent, this is obviously a scalable yes. situation. Is it all going to be benevolent or is there going to be multiple collaboration kind of? Oh no, we problem? already collaborate um, mm. a lot with people and I'm sure you'll see announcements mm. over the next 12 months about we mm. are UNET, uh, AZ, AZ, AZ mm. collaboration. Um, we are developing all the time new relationships because as I said earlier, we can use our technology in mm. any disease. Mm and finding creative ways of making it as available as possible, um, working um, collaboratively uh, with, with companies large and small and, and other organisations will be really good, I think. Okay. And if there's one uh, thing that you sign off as a sort of lesson of innovation within our industry, what would, what would you say to everyone? Ooh, that's a difficult one. But I, 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 I didn't send it to you in that one side. But no, but the one lesson in innovation it has to be about the people. Pick the right people yeah. who've got the, the right mentality to not only have the ideas but drive them forward. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jackie. My pleasure. It's been Thank really you. great talking to you. Well, and time went so fast. <laughs>